Welcome to the Big Unlock Podcast, where we discuss digital transformation and emerging technologies in healthcare. Here, some of the most innovative thinkers and leaders in healthcare and technology talk about how they are driving change in their organizations. Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to my podcast. And this is Patty, and it is my great privilege and honor to introduce my special guest today, David Cork, a newly appointed CIO for Innova Health System in Northern Virginia. David, thank you so much for joining us, and welcome to the show. Uh, Patty, thank you for having me, and it's a great pleasure and honor to be uh, talking with you today. Thank you. Thank you. So you've recently come on board as CIO for Innova Health System. Can you share a little bit about your technology environment and uh, your high-level priorities in the near term? Sure, I'd uh, be happy to do so. Uh, I am very newly minted in the role. This is week number four for me, but I'm happy to share what I've uh, uncovered in, in the last three and a half weeks. In terms of technology, like many organizations, we're a, a core EMR platform, the Epic platform. We're in the middle of a large ERP, enterprise resource planning deployment across the organization. In terms of our PAC system, uh, we have our core PACs and uh, cardiology system focused around the Fuji. But really, in terms of our priorities in technology, they're exactly the same as the priorities of the rest of the organization. Our mission to provide world-class healthcare every time, every touch, in every community, we have the privilege to serve our very thoughtful words in terms of how we've created our mission. And really, when we look within the technology infrastructure and platform, we leverage the exact same goals and mission in terms of how we operate and organize our, our information technology journey. Like many organizations, is towards a service line model and a clinical enterprise. So within IT, we're on that journey too in terms of how we evolve from the facility-based system model to really, as we look at the various different service lines, how do we need to evolve as a service component to that? to support a new service line model, which is essentially a triad model where we have a clinical leadership, a nursing leadership, and an administrative leadership really driving systemness, commonality uh, throughout the organization. The themes that we talk about as a system and within IT really uh, revolve around evolving to a systemness model. So when we talk about every touch, every time, you know, wherever one of our community members interact with an ANOVA caregiver, there's that systemness and commonality of uh, service everywhere we go. Within IT, that customer focus, our customers being the full community of patients we have the privilege to serve, and the customers, which are all the caregivers that go into supporting that care model. High reliability within information technology and the health system is a theme. It's challenging to drive a high reliability organization without a high reliability infrastructure beneath it. Fiscal acumen is something we all in healthcare have to be conscious of. And that model of fiscal acumen relating to value is something that we're very consciously aware of. Then research and innovation is at the core of all we do. We are absolutely focused on looking at research and innovation that will have direct tangible impacts on the care models that we develop. Thank you for that background, and we will unpack a little bit more of that as we go through the conversation. So let me jump right away into a couple of points that you made. One was around the consumer focus, and the other one was around reliability in terms of all the infrastructure, because you can't really drive better experiences and so on unless you have reliable infrastructure that, that enables you to deliver that experience. So Many people refer to what is known as digital transformation today. Many of the things that you refer to are actually components of what I hear as digital transformation when I talk to other health systems. The uh, focus area, at least as far as all the research that we've done in my firm, is clearly on the patient engagement. And following that closely behind is also the caregiver experience and the caregiver enablement so that they can be productive and effective. So can you talk to us a little bit about what you're doing specifically in terms of the patient experience and the patient engagement aspects? We see a lot of health systems 
launching patient apps, digital front doors, as they've been called in a very generic way. Can you talk to us a little bit about what you're doing in that regard? Absolutely. In general terms, our approach to the patient experience or digital transformation is really not focused around a particular technology, but really a suite of technologies. And rather than look at how we deploy telehealth, how we do our digital front door, we really want to think in terms of the patient experience and the caregiver experience. To that end, when we think about terms like reimagining primary care, breaking down in a kind of lean-like model, understanding the touch points and how we deliver primary care from that front door app through to uh, scheduling, through to arrival, through to rooming, through to you know ordering results, the, the, the visit, the post-visit. And rather than look at a specific technology and how we're going to deploy it, we really want to leverage how we want that experience to be for our patients and for our caregivers and really look at uh, technology as just the enabler, not for its own sake. So the example being, you know, as we look at our front door, as we look at arrivals, looking at geolocation, looking at how we welcome, how we greet the patient with equipping the caregivers with the right technology, how we room the patient, how we engage the patient during the visit, how we make the EMR more passive in that say rather than at the forefront, you know, the, the, the analogy of the, the caregiver trying to keep up on the keyboard as the patient is uh, we're working through the components of the visit. We really want to look at technologies where the EMR becomes a vital but more passive element of that and really is an enabler in terms of the care model. So we're excited at looking at technologies where there's passive listening. There's been some recent announcements that we're excited about exploring in that model. And the the concept of the provider being bent over a keyboard and not perceived to be attentive to the patient's needs is something we really want to explore and how we add value to that visit and make the, the process of gathering data, presenting data in a much more passive way. Rather than look at a particular technology or how we'll do, we really want to break down the experience from a patient first perspective and make sure that the technologies that we're deploying and looking to deploy really facilitate a much smoother experience for both the patient and the caregiver. Just on that point of making the EHR systems more usable, more passive, you know, obviously everybody talks about the huge burden that's come down on caregivers because of the digitization of medical records, which was necessary, but at the same time, it's had some unintended consequences. So can you just talk a little bit about one or two specific things you have done to make make the EMR systems more usable and give some time back to caregivers, because that seems to be one of the big issues. Right. What One of the things that we're exploring right now is in the acute care setting, we have, I'll use the term system to talk about all the components of a system, not a specific system. All our caregivers have a, a badge with an identity component that has the ability for us to identify that caregiver. We have systems that identify the patients that we have in every room. We have computers in rooms that know where the patients are. And we have wireless technology that can inform us of movement and locations. Yet, when a caregiver, be it a a nurse at med administration or a hospitalist rounding, today still has to go from device to device to device, almost in a muscle memory model, bouncing from screen to screen. So we're right now interested in exploring technologies that combine a variety of systems to facilitate care. So For example, if I'm a nurse and it's three o'clock in the afternoon and it's med admin time, why can't the systems know that I'm nurse quirk, know the room that I'm walking into, know the patient that I am there to, to attend to, know that it's probably med admin time. So why can't these systems, as soon as I identify and walk into the room, bring me a credential onto the system through a touch or through a a more passive model, bring me right 
and present me the exact information on the patient I need, probably in the, in the MAR, the medication administration record, rather than have me move from room to room and go through the exact same exercise. And you can use that analogy, whether I'm a hospitalist, whether I'm an MA taking vitals, whether I am a consultant that's there to do a specific consult on the patient. So we really want to look at technologies that certainly facilitate access, facilitate the display of information, and really look at how we bend the curve on clinician burnout and how we can support technologies and invest and research in technologies that really take that out. Those technologies are not mutually exclusive of security. They're not mutually exclusive of other components that we have. They really are complementary. So those are those are things in terms of direct research that we want that we're looking to do and we want to do that will really kind of bend the curve in the other direction in terms of presentation, access and facility of use of, of these tools. So those are great examples. Let's switch to the, the patient engagement on the patient experience aspects of what, what you just talked about. So there's a huge innovation ecosystem out there that is really focusing on that one area, how to you know, engage patients better, how to create better experiences. Big tech firms are involved in this. Yeah. Many health systems are developing their own applications. And of course, there's a whole ecosystem of startups that are getting billions and billions in we see money to develop these innovative new solutions. How are you going about transforming or reimagining, as you said, the patient experience? Are you doing it all internally? Are you using a partner ecosystem, a combination of the above? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think, you know, just as we see large organizations come together, and I think, you know, with, with, with the CVS Aetna's, with its large payers and different kind of uh, retail models, I think we're going to see, we see an environment where we can comfortably exist as partners and competitors. So the model of, you know, where where we look at partnering in the delivery of some care and we compete in other areas. So as we look at some of our own development on our patient experience and patient engagement tools, we are also looking at partnership with academic organizations, with regional incubators and hubs. And we've recently acquired the Exxon campus across from uh, one of our our core hospitals, Fairfax Hospitals, which is a 117-acre campus that we will be further developing, and that will be one of our core innovation hubs. And within there, we see academic partnerships, we see commercial partnerships, and we really want that innovation to be a regional hub where we develop these patient engagement, patient experience tools in partnership with the patient because patient first and really understanding. And as we move ourselves through the care continuum, either as a, in the ambulatory setting, as we hopefully not that much in the acute care setting, but we've got to connect to how the patient and family members feel and engage them in this development process. I see a lot of organizations doing wonderful work but I question whether we really understand the consumer and we really understand the needs of that consumer and the fears and expectations of the different kind of consumers we have. My dear mother in Ireland has a different expectation of care and different needs than a, my younger brother who's, you know, more mobile enabled, let's say, than my dear old mother. So I think we got to understand and engage the consumer as we develop these tools. So I would hope that Certainly, our journey will have a large patient-first, patient-informed component of how we develop these tool sets. Yeah. Now, talking about innovation, you know, I wrote recently about uh, the two-canoe problem for healthcare, which is you have a here and now that you have to take care of, keep the lights on. But you also have to invest for the future. And as a system, as a as a sector, Healthcare is still pretty much uh, relying on fee-for-service reimbursements. Only about a third of the payments are going through some kind of an alternate payment model or value-based care model. In this context, now you know the reimbursement is declining. You have not as much discretionary funds as you need. At the same time, you know that to be ready for the future, you make all these big investments. It's really encouraging to hear that you made this big investment in acquiring this large piece of land and you're going to build out innovation. How do you actually do the trade-offs and how do you 
sort of build a business case for these investments at a system level? What kind of ROI expectations or non-ROI expectations do you have from these innovation programs? Can you talk a little bit about the thinking process on this? Sure. And I think there are certainly a variety of different payment models out there in the different markets that I've been exposed to, be it New York, be it Maryland market, Pennsylvania, or the Virginia market. I think the successful organizations will always put patience first and quality first and outcomes. And I think everything else follows. So I absolutely understand the two canoe model, but I think organizations that focus certainly have to attend to that. But really when our, our core focus is the delivery of high quality, high value care, that's I think the focus of us as a health system. As we put our our patients first, engage our team members in how we give the best value and the best quality outcomes possible. All the rest follows, I believe, Patty. I think driving one payment, you know, chasing one payment model versus another, I think is something we have to be aware of. But at the core of what we do has to be the delivery of world-class care. Okay, let's talk about the technology environment. Technology is obviously playing a very big part in the transformation that health systems are going through much more so than in you know in years gone by. You're seeing a shift in the landscape. We're seeing the big tech firms moving into healthcare. They're offering the cloud platforms or other technology platforms, and they want to get into healthcare in a big way. But my firm's research suggests that most health systems are really looking by default at the EHR system to drive innovation to drive some of these patient experiences and optimize the investments, the big investments that have been made in EHR systems before you go out and start looking at you know, an alternate or an additional platform. How do you see this balance between some of the capabilities that these big tech firms bring to the table, cloud, advanced analytics, AI, machine learning, so on, with what EHR systems are really good at but may not be so good at? How do you do the trade-offs? I think I would challenge you, Shumson, that there needs to be a trade-off. I would go back to you know the comment I made about partner and competitor. Organizations like Amazon do a really good job of delivering hundreds of millions of parcels throughout the country and the world. We have much to learn from models like that in the healthcare delivery business. We are challenged as an industry with elements of patient care, let's, like med reconciliation. We, the care community, uh, be you a acute care provider, be you a primary care, be you a pharmacy benefit management, be you a retail pharmacy, we as a system can do a better job of ensuring that we get the right medications in the right dose to the right person at the right time. And we minimize the harm that we, the health delivery system, the avoidable harm that's out there. So I, for one, would be really keen to understand how we partner with organizations to learn from machine learning, to learn from AI, to learn from analytics that we as an industry, we, the whole healthcare industry, have not really looked at deeply to see how we can deliver better care to our patients and avoid some of the components that of risk and harm that exist in our system today. You make an interesting point about these partnerships, and I just wanted to refer to some recent partnerships that have been announced, uh, specifically the ones involved health system. Cleveland Clinic and American Well, you know, that mm-hmm. there was a announcement that came out recently. We're seeing others too, you know, Centene with Walgreens on the whole PBM space, Microsoft and Humana, and Google and Mayo. So can you talk to uh, how, what these partnerships really signify in terms of a market trend? And can you maybe talk to, you know, any partnerships that you've built similar to any of these? Yeah, we certainly are, are, as we develop our Innova Center for Personalized Health, which is our new campus, we are creating partnerships with both academic and commercial organizations. I can't speak to those at this point. That will be coming soon. But I think it's inevitability when we look at the opportunities that exist for us to drive more and more quality into care. I think it's reasonable that we see large partnerships when we look at the national spend, both here within our own country and globally, the cost of healthcare and the percent GDP 
that is invested in healthcare, it's not surprising that more and more large institutions and global organizations are looking at how they can participate and facilitate the delivery of better care. So, frankly, I'm not surprised by this. I think I'm surprised that it took this long for us to start seeing these kind of relationships begin to evolve. I think it's still in the nascent stage in terms of how we work together and how we align. But I think it's there's a level of inevitability to this. And frankly, a level of excitement. I think there are skill sets that these organizations bring to our industry that we have not explored fully. And they are far more mature in some of these other industries. So from my perspective, I see it as a catalyst to accelerate our ability to deliver quality care. Uh, That's very well said. So let's talk quickly about uh, the non-traditional players that are getting into healthcare, right? You mentioned CVS. Uh, We're also seeing Walgreens get into the primary care, urgent care space, Walmart, even Amazon. You know, we we saw recently that Amazon made an acquisition of a company that does symptom triaging. They're also forming partnerships to deliver telehealth is is what I saw. How do you see the landscape shifting in terms of the non-traditional players and where they fit into the future state of healthcare delivery relative to where traditional health systems are? I think, again, there's a level of inevitability. When you look at these large players, these are some of the largest employers in the country. And they, like all other employers, are seeing the cost of healthcare and the delivery of healthcare for their team members, for their employees, continue to go up. And with the skill sets that they bring, I think there's, and you know, the capabilities that they could bring to such a large owned employee base and how they could have an impact on value and outcomes. Again, I think it's exciting. And I think it's something that we should embrace. And like any significant shift in an industry, be it the steam engine, the motorized car, I think those that embrace it and those that really want to understand how they can participate in the bending of the curve in the other direction, I think will be the ones that will benefit the most. I think organizations that don't see the change and see where the puck is going may find themselves on the not realizing as much benefit as those that, you know, understand where the, the change is, embrace this change. And it is a significant, it is going to be a, I think a quantum change in how healthcare is delivered. But I think if we embrace it, we understand it, we get comfortable with being a partner and a competitor. You know, this is one of the most exciting times to be in healthcare technology because of these new organizations that want to participate in the delivery of care. I want to get your final thoughts on a couple of things. Uh, I do something called a lightning round where, you know, I get your top of mind thoughts on a few emerging technologies and how you're using them or deploying them in your own environment. So let's start with one that you already alluded to a little earlier on, artificial intelligence. Yeah, I think it's, again, when we lever- when we look at how we still require our providers to manually enter data, when there are systems and tools out there in our homes that have facility to understand questions, to interpret questions, to predict questions, for us not to be looking at technologies where we can leverage machine learning, leverage this kind of passive component of consuming and presenting clinical data, be it in a office visit, be it in a ICU, be it in an OR for that matter. The ability for us to leverage AI and machine learning to facilitate the delivery of care and move away from the keyboard. I envision a day in the future where 20 years from now, a CIO will be talking to you and talking about, you know, the days when keyboards disappeared. <laughs> and, and, you know, we, 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 we chuckle, but it was not 15, 20 years ago where people assumed surgical site infections were a inevitability of running an OR. People thought that clapsies was an inevitability in, you know, having a, an IV in somebody. Today, we've moved the needle in terms of quality and outcomes where they become more and more a never event. I'm looking forward to the days where we talk about med reconciliation and harm that occurs around that process being a never event. I'm excited about the days where we, people chuckle and laugh about 
the times when we were requiring clinicians to peck away at keyboards to enter data that systems yeah. should and could be able to do for them. Yeah, so that you know, UI-less interfaces or whatever they're beginning to call them now, and that's probably a perfect segue into the next thing I wanted to get your thoughts on, voice recognition. Yeah, I, I think the ability for us to understand voice in terms of the collection and assimilation of data and the ability for us to understand voice in terms of the IoT setting. When we look at attending and caring for people more and more in a home setting, tools and technology around understanding voice and understanding triggers of voice, I think is something that voice technology, beyond just the ability to consume and present data, I think voice as a diagnostic as an analytic tool in terms of care models would be interesting and exciting. When we look at safety, when we look at agitation, when we look at this, triggers in there that help us identify scenarios or events where we could avoid conflict, avoid challenging, de-escalate scenarios and predict scenarios. So I think voice has got a lot of potential beyond where we're looking just now in terms of consumption and presentation. I think as a, dare I use the term, diagnostic tool in our care delivery model, I think there's some companies out there doing exciting studies on voice levels and mood. So I, I think as we move forward, voice will become not just a recording, reporting, I think it will become part of our diagnostic process. Yeah, that's great. One more before we round this out. Uh, And healthcare is, I ask this because healthcare is typically and predominantly an on-prem environment. So cloud, where do you see healthcare in terms of cloud enablement and cloud adoption in the coming years? I'm a massive proponent of cloud technologies. One of the things that as we design and engineer and architect cloud solutions, it's really critical that we understand the patient care and operations models of those clouds. And we design, you know, I mentioned earlier, high reliability in our delivery of care requires high reliability in the availability of systems. So when we in the IT world think about high reliability, we need a way to shift and think about the delivery of care in our ambulatory acute care settings and how we design and architect cloud solutions that will support events that occur. And I was privileged or lucky enough to be in Manhattan and supporting organizations during the 9-11 outage. And these things, you know, unfortunately, you know, are something we have to think about and plan for as we design and architect cloud solutions and the ability for us to ensure that the privilege we have of creating these tools and systems to support patient care and the architecture that, that we design around that supports organizations at every potential scenario what could occur. So I'm a massive advocate. I think it's, there's a tremendous potential for value in cloud solutions, but we, we've got to be cognizant of how we develop high, reliable cloud solutions that will support highly reliable healthcare delivery. But David, it's been such a pleasure speaking with you, and thank you so much for uh, sharing your thoughts. And uh, we wish you the very best in your new role and all success to you, and look forward to staying in touch. Adi, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to talk to you today. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. Subscribe to our podcast series at www.thebigunlock.com and write to us at info at thebigunlock.com.